Welcome everyone to my talk on Heidegger on Chida and art and space. Before I begin, feel free to subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram or Twitter, and I also have a Patreon account if you enjoy my work. It would be great if you could contribute to this ongoing project of mine that I have here at the Classical Philosophy channel. In 1969, Heidegger dedicated a seminal text to the work of the Spanish Basque sculptor Eduardo Chida. The material Chida chose for his monumental sculptures was often forged iron, but also alabaster and wood. Chida's work caught Heidegger's attention precisely for its non-representational, non-symbolical look, which to Heidegger means that in Chida's sculpture there lingers the possibility of freeing man and earth from the clutches of metaphysical and framing. In the following I present a reconstruction of Heidegger's argument in his short text dedicated to Chida's art. An argument properly understood is not the construction of correct propositions from which one derives truthful statements about certain data. An argument in its own right brings to the fore a phenomenon in its own right. That means it lets something appear of its own accord. Here we are concerned with space, with how space occurs. Heidegger's text on Chida is entitled Die Kunst und der Raum, Art and Space. One could immediately assume that Heidegger makes a rather obvious point. That is, art in so far as it is produced of some material always occupies some space. Put differently, every sculpture, every painting take up, takes up space and hence its volume can be measured. Heidegger, however, attempts to do something else entirely. He tries to show that these sculptures of Chida invite us to think after the meaning and the event of space in a decidedly non-scientific but artistic and poetic way. The intent of Heidegger's text, where intent does not mean a certain outcome or desiderata, but rather something like attempting to lay bare how something occurs, is an understanding, often a response to the phenomenon of space, which does not take space as a parameter. In the work which initiates Heidegger's thinking path, the work called Being in Time, Heidegger begins to think after space in a non-Newtonian way and attempts, in a first instance, to disclose how space spaces. That means how space occurs, how it takes place, and how space is meaningful outside the narrow computational scope of physical space or Newton's definition of space. In short, and this probably does not do full justice to Newton, the Newtonian definition of space is the distinction between absolute space as spatium, extension or extended receptacle, and relative space as the spaces we can measure relative to absolute extension posited a priori. Heinrich Wiegand Petzit, in his book Encounters with Heidegger, remembers an encounter he actually himself had with Chida, where they discussed the nature of space. Their conversation was in English, so they spoke of space, which originates from the Latin word spatium, which meant extension. Yet Chida vehemently objected to this view of space. Space for Chida is precisely not what is measurable and surveyable. Space is not Newtonian relative space qua receptacle, within which Chida places and positions his sculptors. That is especially noteworthy, as G Petzit notes, because Chida has come to be considered the sculptor who is able to encompass space, or that the forms of his works firmly establish themselves in space. The ways in which we usually describe space, or how we think of it, which we are so accustomed to cover over how space originally occurs. Heidegger's public talk or short text on Chida primarily deals with the enigmatic interplay of spatiality and Gestaltung. Put differently, Heidegger wishes to show that there is an, an occurring of space that we all too immediately conceal. In order for there to be a sculpture, a body, the sculptor 
must be aware of limits and demarcations, forms and material, and also of spatial dimensions. It seems as though the sculptor fills space, tries to possess space with his sculptors. sculptures. It seems as though the body of the sculpture, qua present and available object, fills empty space. Why then does Heidegger claim that the spatiality of sculpture is enigmatic? Is it not most obvious that all art forms of sculpture are, that of all art forms, sculpture is the most spatial of all? Heidegger asks, the sculptural body embodies something. Does it embody space? Heidegger also wonders in what sense sculpture could at all embody or occupy space. He argues that art, and in particular sculpture, invites us to think after the nature of space itself, if we question our ordinary understanding of space. Sculpture invites us to question the definition of space inherited from Newton and Galileo, and it invites us, Chida, Chida's work invites us to ask whether, in fact, this is all there is to space, whether space is exhausted by measurability and subsequently the will to dominate space as such an entity. Is space, Heidegger asks, and I quote, this uniform thing, homogeneous to all sides, equivalent towards each direction, but not perceptible with the senses. The sculptures of Chida, Heidegger is convinced, give us the possibility to rethink space precisely in the age of technology, the age of mathematical measurement of the world, hence the age in which the human being is seemingly ever more capable of dominating the transcendental matrix of mathematized space, of setting necessary conditions at will that allow the near-perfect control of the global flow of goods and services, including human beings, the nearly perfectly automated global air traffic, or just the bus or train we might have taken this morning to get to where we needed to be. When we move, we represent our moving as moving through space as an extension, and we move from point A to point B within that receptacle. We map the world, and it works perfectly fine. We map the world accordingly, and as our world access is increasingly determined by technology and its mathematical precision, by such tools as Google Maps and others, we have near-perfect dominance even over the most benign spatial relations, when we can and will calculate the distance to any destination and the time it will take to get there by various means of transportation. By the way, just as a side note, when you go to Napoli, to Naples in Italy, you will find that Google Maps breaks down. It does not really work down there, which is a wonderful thing. Given, of course, that all parameters will hold in accordance with the positings of transcendental logic. The way that the technical epoch discloses, discloses space is at once one of space as a manageable receptacle as well as an obstacle to be overcome. And at the same time, space is also the parameter by which this very obstacle is to be overcome. It's useful for the enforcement of dominance, of the will to power. The space of the technical epoch that is, the space together with time as parameters is not a space meant for human dwelling. It's not poetic in any sense. But it's the space, it's a space forced to adhere to and at once enacting the demands of the global economy. Space as a parameter is nothing uncanny or odd. There's nothing weird about that, even though... It is, when you come to think of it, that we have turned space into a parameter, and that's rather uncanny. Does space here, though, in this technological understanding of it, ever show itself as unique in its own right, in its own immeasurable ways, as eigentümlich, as odd or even weird? Does space show itself, or are we doing anything in our power to level out to flatten its 
unique ownness. It is the eigentümlichkeit of space, the ownness of space that Heidegger is after. That very uncanniness of space is immediately eradicated by technology, leveled out, so that man may rest assured that he is in total control. Yet with a word from Goethe, Heidegger reminds us that space is one of those fundamental ur phenomena, fundamental phenomena that causes awe, if not fear. It is to this original experience of space that Heidegger aims to point and direct us, and he believes that especially Chiida's sculptures are capable of that. And by the way, that's what it means to become classical, to understand the fundamental phenomena that inspire awe, if not fear. And then at the same time, one is able to respond to it, to respond to that chaos and not fall into nihilism or skepticism or hedonism, but to become, to become what Nietzsche would call of grand style, where the Dionysian goes together with the Apollinean and wonderful form is created and generated. Chida's works disclose space in a fundamentally different way than the mathematical sciences and technology. Chida's sculpture's relation to space, Heidegger maintains, is precisely not one of domination. Rather, Chida's works show that there is something peculiar, even odd, about space that is covered over in our quotidian dealings with space, where space is but a quantity to be dealt with. This very oddness of space must be allowed for at first, if we are to understand how or if at all space pervades artworks. Heidegger wonders whether the space of sculpture and even the space of our everyday dealings, of our using maps to orientate ourselves as fundamentally but subjectively conditioned preforms and alterations of that one objective cosmic space is space here thought primordially or is space here already concealed? Why is it, asks Heidegger, that, quote, physico-technologically projected space counts as the only true space? If that were to exhaust space, if that were all there is, then any sculpture would be but something present at hand, some object that takes up a certain volume of space. In fact, if reduced to its spatial volume, we could compare the volume of the Venus of Milo with the volume of a dustbin in the Louvre. In a nutshell, Heidegger argues that technology de deprives beings, including places, of their possibility to maintain their peculiarity. Technology aims to produce homogeneity, which reduces the possibility for the human to dwell in the world as is proper to the human being. A way into thinking space properly in its ownness, in its own right, is, as is often the case with Heidegger, by trying to think after the origin of the word in question. This is, however, I would argue, neither an exercise in dusty dictionary work nor is it technically speaking etymology. Rather, Heidegger attempts to trace the original experience with the phenomenon once one might have made and how this experience is articulated in the word. It is a listening to the word in question. And similar like Herder, Heidegger often goes back to the verb instead of the noun. The German word for space is Raum. Heidegger points out that Raum comes from the verb Räumen, which literally translates to to plow and to clear land, and could be thought of in this context as clearing out of the way or clearing away. Thus, the German word Raum, unlike the English space, is not at all to the Latin spatium, to extension. The noun Raum, originates from the activity the human being must necessarily engage in as soon as he finds himself in nature. The act, or as Heidegger would put it, not in nature, but on the earth. The act of clearing away is the freeing of places which can become a home to human beings, can become the place of temples for the gods, graveyards, schools, hospitals, but can also turn battle into battlegrounds and worse, räumen, 
the clearing of places is a fundamental occurrence. And it is in sculpture, most prominently in our age in Chida's sculpture, Heidegger claims, that we can reunite with this fundamental relationship with place. It is in this relationship that we can appreciate and understand again the meaning of place. This precisely in an age that loses the sense of dwelling and lingering. An age in which non-places are erected, non-places to which nothing seems to belong, let alone belong together. We recognize such places if we still have some sense left by the total denial to invite us to linger idly and uselessly. It might just be that assuming an abstract a priori space as the condition for spaces and places is the reason for this alienation. Thus, for Heidegger, place comes first. Not abstract place, but proper places, where human beings are born, dwell, and die. Not place as an abstract concept, not place as something that can be planned, but a place that has come to grow to what it is. Heidegger says each place opens a region, and it does so by gathering things into their belonging to the region. And that, by the way, means that you cannot have everything everywhere. You cannot have <laughs> um, an ice skating range, perhaps in Dubai. Maybe that's not a place, perhaps. Right? Maybe, maybe going skiing in the desert of Abu Dhabi indicates that there's something rather uncanny happening in our epoch. Heidegger's engagement, oh, by the way, of course, we have a little Paris uh, in, in Las Vegas and Venice rebuilt uh, as well. Heidegger's engagement with space and sculpture leads him to ponder the meaning of place and the meaningful being at places. And this is what Heidegger sees embodied in Chiida's artworks. His artworks do not possess space. They don't want to dominate it or operate with it. Quote from Heidegger, art as sculpture, no appropriation of space. Such artworks then are not to be seen as examinations of space different from mathematical measurements of space, nor do they encompass mathematical space. Rather, sculptures such as those of Chida are embodiments of places. They let place be a proper place. They invite us, they invite us to dwell and linger. Sculptures, argues Heidegger, not only invite us to linger, they themselves grant the possibility to dwell and linger. Thus, with Heidegger, we can understand Chida's sculptures as cutting through the Newtonian mathematical conception of space that aims for total dominance, showing that it falls short of a significant understanding of spacing. Chida's work cuts through it and thereby opens up this other more fundamental dimension, the dimension that allows humans to dwell, the, pla the place, that's the place. We have to think after the plastic, the sculpture by Chida a bit more in order to see what takes place with them. With Heidegger, we no longer think such sculptures as in terms of volume, taking up space and as dividing space at its limits. The ordinary understanding of the limit of a sculpture might be that its limit is where the sculpture ends and where something else begins. Considering the limit, the outer lines of the sculpture, if it makes any sense to speak of an outer and an inner with regards to sculpture, to be where the figure to, to, is to be where the figure ends allows one to measure its volume and the relative space it takes up in absolute space. Yet with Heidegger, we think limit not as the end of something, but as the beginning of something. This is most notably the case with death in being and time. Death is not where Dasein ends, but where Dasein begins. Death is the horizon towards which Dasein is always already, and which as such allows Dasein to be. Thus, the sculpture does not end at its limits. Its limits is where the sculpture begins where it originates. This means that at its limits, the sculpture is not cut off from the world, but that's where things begin. 
because here they enter into re a relationship with the world. At its limits, Jida's sculptures enter into a relationality with the world and with other things. What then is so special about the thing sculpture as opposed to other things? And what is so peculiar about Jida's sculptures? Sculptures are not embodiments of space or engagement with space if space is understood primarily in technological terms. Maybe Heidegger's strangest thought here is that things in themselves are places and do not only belong to places. That's what Heidegger says. Things themselves are places. Jida's monumental sculptures reveal that, Heidegger thinks. Take Jida's iron sculpture Windcomb in San Sebastian. Two iron claws, or calms, reach out into the sea. The wilderness, concealed earth, is pulled into world. The calms reach out and thereby show how the coastal line and the sea, wind, sky, rain and sun, the tides and the cliffs, moon, stars and rock are intimately related and with them the human being. The calms reveal that where the human being roams, wilderness cannot be. It is precisely at the limits of the comms that this is complected, that this complected interrelationality appears. It is their very reaching out into the sea and toward the sky from the stone coast that lets appear world as world that shows the event of spacing. The comms disclose the seemingly obvious that is all too easily covered over. They are not placed in a homogeneous receptacle. Rather, they disclose place and therefore region. The movement or the event of proper space Heidegger describes is the following. Humans are beings who fundamentally clear land and free it for places. Clearing away, making place, even though a fundamental mode of being also bears danger. Place is not possible on the ground of an abstract a priori space. Place is more fundamental than scientific space, Heidegger wants to argue. Space, Raum, is now understood as spacing, Räumen, as the occurring of space. The activity of spacing grounds and founds region and locality. Thus a determinate relationality, a meaningful web, is founded in spacing. The scientifically trained mind is, of course, immediately inclined to ask, but where does this spacing take place? Does it not take place in relative or absolute space? Or is Heidegger suggesting that human beings generate space in their spacing? To this, I can only briefly answer that this takes place in the fourfold. The four regions between mortals and divinities, earth and sky. Heidegger says, place is not found in the given space of technology and physics. Physico-technological space only unfolds from the workings or prevailing Walten of places in a region. Heidegger ends his talk on Jeda with a quote from Goethe, that gives us another crucial hint at what Heidegger sees in Jida's work. Goethe writes, It is not always necessary that what is true embody itself. It is already enough if spiritually it hovers above and evokes harmony, if it floats through the air like the solemn and friendly sound of a bell. Jida's sculpture of the Windcombs achieve just that. They are not representations or expressions of the spirit placed in nature. They purely hint at, indicate what is there but covered over. The calms show the harmony of the world, the tension-filled harmony in the manifold. Harmony at the cliffs where land and sea meet, but each retain their own. If they were reducible to mass, to a certain amount of volume, they would not show anything to the human being. Thank you very much for listening. Please feel free to leave a comment down there in the comment section. And if you like, feel free to subscribe and support me on Patreon. Thank you very much.